Hello everyone, welcome to The Net Online. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We're gonna kick things off as we always do with a short video clip that will correspond with our message today. Be sure to like and subscribe so we can give you future alerts for when we post messages and drop a comment below and thank you guys so much for joining us. So, <laughs> so the title of that short film is called Covet All, Lose All. So we are in the grand conclusion of our series, Dumb Things That People Do to Mess Up Their Lives. And that's 10 parts. So just ask yourself, how many parts did you make? How good is your att church attendance? If you're like, oh, we're finishing a series? I just remember the first one. <laughs> or perhaps you heard one or two parts, but the fact is that we did 10 parts and today is the grand conclusion. So I don't think I can go back and revisit everything. So, but I'm gonna try to do a little bit of a review anyway for the sake of those that may be new or visiting or maybe you had some other imposition, but uh, I'm just curious. This is a real long shot. I doubt very few people would have heard all 10 parts but I'm curious, we ought to have a board with stars on it and say, wow, these people actually heard all 10 parts. You should get some sort of certificate of achievement. So I'm just curious, how many of you actually heard all 10 parts? Wow, gold stars. All right, so I'd say 10 people out of 100 in the room, right? Okay. I heard all 10 parts. <laughs> yeah, that's right, gold star for me. All right, today, part 10 conclusion, matters of the heart is what this is called. And I, as to true to form, I'm gonna give you number 10. So if you missed so many of the parts, you missed a personal dumb thing story that I told every single week from my personal life. And tonight is the grand finale. Tonight, this morning is the grand finale of all my personal dumb things. So when I was, oh, we need to pray before we go into personal dumb things, right? Yeah, because I could lose my way easily on this one. Lord, we, uh, we just thank you today for your word. We thank you for the moral law of God. We thank you that you have laid out such a clear map and blueprint for, for living life 
well and for living life in a way that's pleasing to our Creator. So God, we just come to you today that, that you would customize and tailor make this message to make it work for everyone that's here. We commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, my personal dumb thing. Here we go, drum roll. Logan? All right, here we go. So, <clears throat> hunting bullfrogs with a BB gun. Okay, so, <clears throat> on my grandparents' property, we had actually, you could go ahead and show, that those are actually fried frog legs, and those are what my grandmother, that's how they looked when she cooked them. And so if you could go to the next picture. Okay, so that was my world in the summers for years. And so I started my beginning, starting points of my expedition days began with my, my rover tractor, a little cadet it's called, and I spent many, many hours on that little tractor going all around my, parent, my, uh, my grandparents' property. They had about 100 acres in northern Arkansas in the, in the, uh, near Mountain Home. And so this, this tractor was my way of getting around. And you'll notice on the tractor there was a BB gun attached to the little lever right above the back tire. But when I first started hunting, there were these ponds, these cattle ponds were loaded with big bullfrogs. And somewhere in there, I figured out that I could, I could kill them and then we could eat their frog legs. But to do that meant that they showed me how to skin one one time and then after that I had to do it myself. So I went on my hunting expedition. I had my spring-loaded BB gun. The one in the picture is a pump. So I moved up. I learned the hard way. This is the dumb thing. Didn't know about bullfrogs. At first, I would go along the bank and I would look for them sitting there and I'd shoot them in the back of the head with my spring-loaded BB gun. And then they'd go, boom. Okay? And then I'd go pick them up at the bank. Well, that got harder and harder to do, so it was much better, much more plentiful. I could shoot them out in the water, but... I didn't, I eventually had a dog that would go get them for me and I had a 22 and that was a very, very lucrative uh, proposition. But in the beginning, I used a spring-loaded BB gun. That means you get one pump and it just kind of goes boing. And then BB, you can almost hear it going through the air and it hits and go boing, boing. <laughs> it's uh, those little brass BBs, little copper BBs. So anyway. On my hunt, in one of my early hunting expeditions, I got about four or five of these babies. And that may have actually been some of them. I don't know, but I put a pocket knife there for scale. Actually took a picture of my game. So what happened was I had my frogs laid out near the stick shift of my tractor. And I'd lay them out there. And I'd take the long journey back to the farmhouse. And on that long journey back to the farmhouse, as I'm approaching the farmhouse, I'm away from the pond, so that's a good thing. The frogs all started waking up. <laughs> I tell you the truth, they woke up, and all of a sudden I'm like, there's a resurrection happening. <laughs> and these frogs start hopping off of my tractor. And they start hopping out into the woods and into the weeds. And I'm like, oh no, what's happened? And so I'm out there running around chasing down the frogs. And so what it is, is they have very hard bony heads. And I was just giving them a concussion. I was just, <laughs> my little BB gun would just knock them out. And I thought, this is not going to do. So I spent a while trying to herd the frogs. And so I'm running around out in the weeds. Nobody was there to see this, just me and my creator watching the whole thing. <laughs> so I eventually caught all of the frogs and I had to re-kill them. And I had to find a way that it was for keeps. I don't remember how I did it at this point, but I made it for keeps. And Grandma would cook them. Now I was always doubting whether they were ever really dead. <laughs> and I had compassion, you know, even for animals and God's creation. So when she started cooking those frogs in the pan, they hop. The legs move and they twitch. Frog legs just they keep moving even after they're just cooking. <laughs> and you have this like sneaky suspicion like, 
Did I ever really kill them? <laughs> anyway, but that was a dumb thing, is understanding that frogs have a really hard bony head, and then when I'd hit them with a BB gun, I'd just stun them, it knocked them out. And so I had to move on up to a pump pellet rifle and then to a 22 to solve the problem. But nonetheless, it was kind of an embarrassing moment. I don't know if you, is it really a dumb thing? You know, it could happen to anybody, but nonetheless, that's what happened. So, hope you enjoyed that story, Mariah. She told me the other day, it's her favorite part of this whole series. She doesn't want to miss the story at the beginning of each part. So here's a scripture I want to preface as we summarize the Ten Commandments. In 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. What an interesting passage. In other words, he's saying that the sensible thing to do, the intelligent thing to do, is to live above sin, is to reject sin. Um, uh, living in a way that you know is not right. Live according to the moral law of God. Live in a sensible way. And so when we live according to the moral law of God, it's by design. That means that we're living more intelligently and life really will go well for us. So I, the scripture says in Proverbs, happy is he who keeps the law. That there's a certain satisfaction, a certain peace, a certain kind of living with ourself that we're able to do. And it's, it's a very valuable thing to have that sense of clear conscience. And so we look at the 10. Here they are, just to refresh your memory. Uh, the first two are like a pair. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods besides me. So God from the very beginning has always claimed supremacy and that our relationship with him is of supreme concern for every human being. Number two, you shall not worship any graven image so that means there can be nothing that stands between us and God, no idols, nothing that we make into an idol. It is, it is freedom by design. God, uh, you see that in the very beginning of Exodus where we read these, the Ten Commandments, that he prefaces it all as that God has set you free from the house of bondage, that it's his laws that bring freedom. It's not the other way around. So number three you should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, meaning that you should not desecrate or trivialize the name of the Lord. Number four, remember the Sabbath day. That is the day of rest to keep it holy. We spent a lot of time on that. And the title of that week was, Are You Dating the Church? Because a lot of times our attitudes towards our devotion life, the way we live our lives in, retro, in, in a practical way, is we see sometimes even the church as a hobby, as something optional, something I can take it or leave it, instead of something we truly put our roots down in and become vested in. And so that was remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Number five, this is the pivot point. The first four commandments are really talking about our relationship with God. And that that's the first things first. Number five is the pivot commandment. This one goes to the heart of even government. Honor your father and mother. This is the first unit of self-government, the family. And so honor your father and mother. It's the, in the title of that one was those parents of ours. We talked about our parents. We talked about difficult parents. We talked about great parents. We talked about what our attitudes should be. How is it that we honor our parents? How is it that we potentially dishonor them? And so, but the pivot point here is how we treat people, how we treat our neighbor. And so this one goes, honor your father and mother as the authorities in our life. Number six, you shall not murder. And the title was respect human life, the value of life. So, uh, and we, we looked at that and you think, well, gosh, you know, when, who is here going to murder somebody and this kind of thing. But we talked about that we have a culture of death in our country today where we're accepting and giving a waiver to people to kill their own babies, for instance. And perhaps you were assisting, perhaps you were counseling somebody, perhaps you were somehow complicit in that process. Perhaps you voted for somebody who believes in open season on unborn babies. You see, so, so where we think, oh, well, I would never murder somebody, but in fact, we may be participating in a culture of murder and need to repent, you see. And so we should not murder. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. 
And this one, really, the title was Respect and Value Marriage, Support Family. God is for family. And adultery, really, in each of these is a category of moral law. It's not like an exhaustive list. And so we talked about all of the various kind of nuances of that, of that violation, that the, the breakdown of morality and moral standards and boundaries that God has ordained that we walk in, that fornication and even porn addictions and things like this are all really under the covering of this commandment. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal, number eight. In other words, that was titled Respect Private Property and how important it is and how the Bible affirms the value of personal and private property. And that is actually God ordained. It's not something the government has given you permission to own private property on your own and this kind of thing and they can take it away. No, no, this is a, this is a right that God has given us in his law that there is a right to private property, you see. And so, uh, so you shall not steal, respect private property. And then number nine, you shall not bear false witness. And then the title of that was loving the truth. And so we have, it's, it's not, you know, as people translate, uh, oftentimes will quote number nine as you shall not lie. It doesn't really say that. It's really talking about the worst of all lies and that is perjury. The most diabolical of all lies would be perjury and to be able to undermine somebody's innocence and have them falsely accused and even have to serve a sentence because you lied about the evidence. Uh, and so you shall not bear false witness in them, but within a category of morality, it does include you shall not lie. Number 10, this is where we are today. You shall not covet anything that is your neighbor's. Now, we'll look at the text in just a moment. But one of the things I want to mention before we kind of go into this, and I, I mentioned it last week, but a lot of times we may, you know, where we have been guilty or where we have violated some of these commandments in our lifetime, maybe we've stolen, maybe we've lied, hopefully not bear false witness, but, but we, all of us in this room, no doubt, have been guilty on some level regarding the commandments and the moral law of God. And that's why we so desperately need Jesus. Because we have a burden of guilt that rests on us and we need relief from that guilt. And so God offers us pardon if we meet his basic conditions. Basic conditions are that we are honest with God, that we are willing to confess our sin to him, to repent, to come before him. And even sometimes there's a need for restitution to make things right. But when we come to God honestly and we come to him humbly, he will cleanse us of these areas of sin. Many people will go their entire lives and have such difficulty ever coming to a point of humility and honesty where they could actually, uh, actually receive the kind of cleansing and freedom that comes from his pardon that he offers through Jesus through the cross. Um, but that pardon is available to everybody if we'll just meet these simple conditions. What are, that's such good news. Because every one of us has some load of guilt. Every human being has some load of guilt, but that's such good news that we have, that we carry as the people of God. So never underestimate the profound effect on the human conscience of lying and stealing. So Israel Bailey was sharing with me last week after church a story from his past. And I was very intrigued by the story. It was very engaging. And I, I'm, an, I'm asking him to come and share that story with us this morning. I'll need an extra mic. Yeah, there you go. Here. You see, this, you see the switch? Yeah, it's kind of hidden. Secret switch. So not anybody can grab it. All right, so hold it close. Okay. Y'all right. can hear me? You ready for me to share this yes, sir. dumb thing that I did? It was a terrible thing, y'all. It. Okay, so I was probably nine, around eight, nine, or ten, somewhere in there, and I had been dreaming of a, of a marine band harmonica in the key of G. And it was 1995 at the music shop. Well, I grew up as a missionary kid. My, 
I grew up traveling in Mexico with my parents, and um, we, we came up out of Mexico and drove through Texas and went to Marietta, Oklahoma, where my grandmother, my dad's mom, lived. And uh, we got in about 2.30 in the morning and went to her little guest bedroom, and I found underneath that guest bedroom something that looked like a piece of paper, and it was a $20 bill. Well, I figured to myself real quick in my little mind, Grandma doesn't even know it's here. In her mind, she's lost it. You know, finders keepers, right? So I took that $20 bill because all I could see was a harmonica in the key of G. You know, not plastic. It was, it's a nice wooden, beautiful little harmonica in its own little case. I loved I, I desired to play the harmonica. I actually learned to play on this harmonica that I wound up taking this $20 bill from my grandmother's house. And since we hadn't been to our house yet, I devised a plan to take this $20 bill, roll it up really small, fold it really small, and planned to be to the bathroom first before any of my, uh, at that point there were, I had six brothers and sisters. There was eight of us in all by the end of it. But anyway, so I take this $20 bill, and there's more to this plan than just, oh, I'm gonna throw it in this bathroom. While we were in Mexico, we, we spent about 10 months out of every year in Mexico. A, uh, Someone who, uh, I, we don't even know who the man was. He was a homeless man who uh, needed a place to stay, so my dad let him stay in our house while we were in Mexico. Grandma had called him, got permission and all that. He stayed two or three nights, and then he left. Well, I thought to myself, if I take this $20 bill and throw it in the bathroom and then run back out and then say, oh, hey, i got to go to the bathroom. I'm cleaning the bathroom first. I'll get this $20 bill. And that's exactly what happened. I come back out. And, and we have no way of getting hold of this guy, which was great. Um, and said, Dad, look what I found. I found a $20 bill in the bathroom. And he's like, hey, that's amazing. That's like God's provision. You know, and instantly I started feeling really bad, you know. But not bad enough not to tell the truth yet. I still wanted a harmonica. So I take this, and uh, he knew I wanted the harmonica my dad did. So we took, and I bought that harmonica, and I learned to play really well. I love playing the harmonica. Do you still have it? Uh, I don't know if I do or not. Um, Just it curious. It might have been lost. I, I have a case of them now, but uh, it might be in there. I'm not sure. At any, any, at any rate, because my dad is a missionary, and he's traveling and getting to share with churches, he would share this story over and over again, how God provided for his son Israel $20 to, to get this. And I could, y'all, I lived with that until, until my 20s. And I became a missionary, and I still couldn't share this story because I thought Satan would say, what if they find out? What if they find out? They'll think terrible of you. And I'm like, they will. That's still from my grandmother. You know, it was awful. I mean, I lived with a terrible way. It just built and built and built. It was absolutely terrible. And I finally... Now, he stopped sharing. That wasn't the very first year he would share that. Well, um, I just lo lived with this guilt. Every time I looked at a harmonica, I would remember that $20 bill right there under the uh, passenger side of the bedroom there, you know. And uh, <laughs> right up underneath the foot leg, just, just right behind it. it, was, it was, I remember exactly the dust that had knocked off of it. Um, every time I looked at a harmonica. And finally, y'all, I'm married at this point. I have kids at this point. And I finally came to dad. My grandma has since passed away. And you know, there was no restitution or anything like that. It was, just, it was just complete terrible on me. I went to my dad and said, dad, I have to confess this to you. It is eating me up. I can't look at a harmonica anymore. You know, <laughs> I stole $20 from grandma. You know, when I was nine years old, he said, all of a sudden, we figured that out years ago. <laughs> he said, I'm, I'm glad you came, finally told us. You <laughs> So, moral of the story is come clean quick, you know, it just eats you up really bad for a long, the longer you hold on to it, <laughs> the worse it feels. So, that's awesome. Uh, that, that's about the story. So, did your dad know when he was in the, holding those meetings and he was testifying in your behalf, like, look how the Lord provided for Israel? I was really quick to get the forgiveness session over with and I never really asked that far Did he it. know then? He, he must have. He, I don't know if he did or was not. He, like, he might have just been, you know, Israel's going to come clean. I know. Let me tell you what, I never stole anything after that, though. I mean, it is not worth it. 
to live with that kind of guilt. It's not worth breaking that. So that was powerful. I would need you. to ask him though, Ted, did you really know when you were telling them like an angel might have, this guy might have been an angel that dropped this $20? I'd off? like to know if he knew. Oh, no, I, I need to find out. But yeah, no, that's. Thank you for sharing. That's beautiful. Well done. <laughs> This is an actual photo of him at nine years old. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so let's, actually, let's look at the actual text in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17 of the 10th commandment. Uh, you shall not covet. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox. I know a lot of y'all have a real problem with that. <laughs> nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. So we just have to apply that to today's world. Obviously, we don't have ox and donkeys, but, uh, but nothing that is your neighbor's you can't covet. And I do think that this scripture is misunderstood. I did reference it back in part number seven. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recap that in a moment. Uh, that we perhaps can very commonly misapply this verse. So we'll give it some context. So we see, again, a framework of morality. So there are kind of three other, three sins are kind of in a bundle here. The Tenth Commandment represents an entire category of sins of the heart. It's the only commandment that really is particularly dealing with the thoughts and the motives of the heart. Uh, Coveting, envy, and jealousy all tie together. They're all kind of interrelated. To covet uh, is to long jealously to possess what someone else possesses. To envy is to feel resentful and unhappy because someone else possesses or has achieved what one wishes oneself to possess or to have achieved. Jealousy denotes a feeling of resentment that another has gained something that one more rightfully deserves. It can refer to anguish caused by the fear of unfaithfulness or so forth. So I have a notable thought as we delve into this. Coveting has become a favorite American pastime. Today's entitlement mentality leads to class envy and is expressed like this. I have the right to not only want what you have earned, but I now have the right to take possession of what you have earned. So it's not even just necessarily looking at somebody and going, wow, they have a lot, or they, you know, I wish I had what they have. It's more than that. So what we have in the entitlement mentality today is people feeling justified, fully justified, in the redistribution of wealth. So if somebody, these people make more money over here, that means the government takes from what they have and give it to people who did not earn it over here. That's a form of socialism or redistribution of wealth. In the name of fairness, we equalize it. What it does is it de-incentivizes the economy and brings us to a point of bankruptcy. So, and devalues the dollar and a lot of other nasty things. But the point is, is that the entitlement mentality is part and parcel to this whole idea of coveting. It's not just a, I have a desire to have more. It's a willingness to take from people who have more and take it for yourself. And it would also be a form of government theft. You see how it dovetails with you shall not steal. So today we are faced with a revival in new forms of class envy. The growing popularity of socialism leads to policies of government confiscation. So we need to be aware of that and not get sucked into the cultural stream that uh, actually is violating the 10th commandment and the 7th commandment. So I have a clip for you, and I'm going to ask you a question or two about this clip once we watch it. I got two questions for you. What do you do and how do you do it? <laughs> I'm a stockbroker. Stockbroker? Oh. Shit. Had to go to college to be a stockbroker, huh? You don't have to. Had to be good with numbers and good with people. That's it. Hey, you take care. 
Hey, I'm gonna let you hang on to my car for the weekend, but I need it back for Monday. Feed the meter. <laughs> Still remember that moment. They all looked so happy to me. Why couldn't I look like that? Whether they're really happy or not, it's irrelevant. It's the story is based on a true man's kind of journey and uh, an actual, based on a true story. So do you think, and I, I, this is a rhetorical question, but do you think that this is an example of coveting? And then some of you are going, this is a trick question. I don't know if it's fair to have you raise hands or not raise hands and then go into why do you think it is or it is not reflective of coveting. But a lot of people would think that that was perhaps a form of coveting. But here's what I, I'm going to tell you why I think it is not coveting. You need to understand the difference between coveting as intended in the Tenth Commandment and simply wanting to achieve something of a similar result as your neighbor has achieved. In other words, sometimes we can see somebody near us achieving something and it challenges us. Well, if they did that, then perhaps I can do that. If they were able to move along this direction and achieve something, then maybe there's hope for me. Maybe I can also achieve something. So in that sense, it's uh, if you look at a family, like you look at the Barron family, you go, oh my goodness, it's an amazing family, right? Maybe I could have a family like that someday. Well, I'm not going to have a family like that someday. They are my family. Okay, so, all right. So, 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 so the point of that is that it, it raises a standard that challenges us, us about how good we can be, how good it can be, if we build our lives on God's ways, on God's word, on the right foundation. And so, so no, I don't think that was a form of, covetousness or envy, I think it was challenging him as a, as a young man at that time, he was desperately trying to figure out how to provide for his family and he was having such a difficult time doing it. I really identified with the movie because of the way he was trying to get a start in sales and how difficult it was. And he was trying to sell these machines to doctors and, and uh, I really almost felt like it was emblematic of my life when I watched it. Uh, and so, so here we're going to look at matters of the heart, 10th commandment. In Matthew 15, 19, Jesus says this fascinating statement. He says, for out of the heart come forth evil thoughts. Okay, so I put numbers in there. Number 10, that's the 10th commandment. From out of the heart come forth. So anybody that thinks that the New Testament is not, it's all about grace and not law in the sense that it, somehow devalues the Ten Commandments is not true. The New Testament reaffirms the, the Ten Commandments over and over again. It affirms the moral law of God. It obsolesces the ceremonial laws and the hygienic laws and a lot of these things, but the moral law of God remains intact throughout the New Testament. And today, because there's so many people in churches that misunderstand this, they think that somehow grace is counter to the law of God. It, that's not the case at all. The New Testament never negates the moral law of God. It affirms the moral law of God. Jesus affirms the moral law. Paul affirms the moral law. And so, but there's such kind of a popular teaching, easy believism, that if you just believe and grace covers you and we're not under the law, and so it's kind of a superficial, shallow view of the law in that sense, not really understanding the context of what, uh, what Paul meant by the law in that context. Okay, so when Jesus is saying this, he is affirming the moral law of God. He cites here five of the commandments or six of the commandments. So number one, for out of the heart comes forth evil thoughts, commandment number 10. Murders, commandment number six. Adulteries, commandment number seven. Sexual sins, also commandment number seven. You understand he's generalizing now the categorical view of 
you shall not commit adultery is broad in its nature. And so he says, including sexual sins of all various types. Thefts, commandment number eight. False testimony, commandment number nine. And blasphemies, which commandment would that be? Number three. So how many is that? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six of the commandments listed in one Verse of scripture quoting Jesus. So coveting is the starting point of all of these other sins. Without the coveting on the front end, these other sins never happen. Coveting is craving and obsessing over something that you are not entitled to have. It leads towards bad choices. So to give a better context of this. We're going to look at one of the verses, and I did this, what, three or four weeks ago, but it's one of the verses that's most commonly misunderstood when it comes to coveting. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus' words, he's saying, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that everyone who gazes at a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. So what's happened is people over the years, and I've heard it quoted so many times, and that is the idea is conveyed that people think that if you think something that you've committed adultery or the equivalent. So number one mistake is to make it into an equivalence or make it some, in some sort of math equation where if you think it, then you've done it, so then it's the same thing, you're guilty as if you had done it. Now I don't know about you, but, but if somebody thought about murdering me, and they actually did murder me, it actually matters. I would far prefer they just think about it. <laughs> so don't create an equivalence like, well, they're thinking about murdering me, they might as well just do it, they're already guilty. I've heard people use this awful reasoning. But what we need to understand is what Jesus is doing in this text is that he is underscoring, he's talking about what adultery is what? The sixth commandment? He's talking about you shall not commit adultery, yes, but he's pointing them to the tenth commandment, which is a matter of the heart. And so when he says he is actually pointing to the tenth commandment, that is not to covet. Anyone who looks, and this is the way... Uh, I love Jason Staples and how he translated this. A Greek reconstruction would be something more like this, Im, Im, uh, implicit in the structure of the way Jesus worded it. Anyone that looks at a woman or wife in order to covet her. Remember, to covet something doesn't mean that the thought enters your mind. And all these young men that I've talked to over the years, they feel so guilty all the time because they saw an attractive woman or a pretty girl and they feel awful because, gosh, you know, something's wrong with me. I noticed a pretty girl, you know, and I'm like, hey, chill, man. You're never going to overcome that. You're stuck with that the rest of your life. You're going to be 95 years old and you're still going to have the problem. It's not your fault and that in the purest sense, it's not your fault. It, God designed you, hardwired you that way. And let's be thankful that it's girls. It's much more complicated if it gets confused. So here's the thing. So his translation, the way this should be worded, is anyone that looks at a woman or a wife in order to covet her. So it's imperative that we understand what coveting actually is. It's not just to think something. In, uh, coveting in the Old Testament denotes, this is another quote from him, coveting in the Old Testament denotes desire directed at obtaining the specific object in question and not merely the existence of the desire itself. You have to understand, it's, it's, it's not just the desire, it's not just the natural desire, it's not just the inclination, it's not just the thoughts. Otherwise, we'd be guilty every time we were tempted with anything. But we're not. Jesus wasn't guilty, and he was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus was not guilty, but he experienced temptation but a lot of people, the devil kind of messes with their head and they start thinking, gosh, I feel tempted. I must be an awful person. Join the, join the crowd. I mean, 
you know, the fact is that temptation is one of those things that's just in the air. There, there's a demonic component to it. It's, it's not that we aren't tempted, it's what we do with it when it comes to us. So there's much more here than simply a natural desire. It's a cultivated longing. Uh, this word, whoever looks, looks upon, uh, uh, looks at a woman, this word is more loaded too. It means to look upon, to gaze, to turn the thoughts or direct the mind to a thing to consider, contemplate, to look at, to weigh carefully, to examine. But in other words, with an eye to how to possess. So, admiring beauty is not a sin. Esther was acknowledged as one of the most beautiful. There's very few people that are actually acknowledged in the Bible as being uh, remarkably attractive, but Esther was one of those. So the Bible itself will acknowledge certain individuals as uh, profoundly beautiful or profoundly handsome, this kind of thing. So the fact that you may notice someone who's profoundly beautiful does not mean, and feel sorry for them. I mean, there's some people that are just so phenomenally beautiful, they, they just, they get more attention than they really want, and it's not even, almost not even fair to them. It's almost like a, a curse they live with. It's, it's probably better just to be ordinary, like the rest of us. So if you're here this morning and you're profoundly beautiful, please don't be offended. <laughs> so there's a difference between admiring something and desiring something. Uh, if, if you say, it's not that you shouldn't want a wife, gentlemen. Ladies, it's not that you shouldn't want a husband. It's just that you should not want her husband. <laughs> or his wife. You follow? That would be the difference in, in coveting and not coveting. I would have a family, I'd like to have a family like that. That's a good thing. That means that the standard's been raised and you're like, man, I want to be like that. If you're jealous of someone else's promotion or their recognition, I've seen it you know, on the job and the business environment, see it within athletics. You can see it within a church environment where somebody gets recognition or promotion and maybe you felt more deserving. And people can really develop a bitter spirit because they feel passed over. When in fact, God may be just trying to bring a lesson, a lesson of humility. All right, let's, I'm going to spend just a little bit looking at the dynamics of temptation. James chapter 1. <clears throat> James, uh, brother of Jesus, he says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. Then the lust, lust here is epithumio, the Greek means a natural desire, a human desire, doesn't mean a, a, a hedonistic desire. Then the lust, when it has conceived, bears sin, and the sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So what you see here is there's a process. You know, you love those, those occasions where somebody falls into temptation or they, what well, just happened? It never just happens. I don't care what they tell you. There is a process. It can happen very quick. All three or four steps here can happen very fast, but it's never just all of a sudden the devil took me over and I did this. It says each one is tempted. See, it starts with temptation, but temptation is not necessarily even from the devil. It's our natural desires. It's our epithumio that kind of leads us to be tempted. When he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed, then the lust, when it has conceived, bears sin, and the sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. You see the progression um, to mull it over, to savor it, to meditate on it, to obsess about it. It's a, that is actually a choice also when we're faced with the temptation. 
The sin of Achan parallels this concept. This is the sin in the Old Testament. Uh, Achan, Israel had a great battle victory and they had all kinds of loot that they had gotten from the enemy, and, and, but it was set aside. Nobody can have it. Nobody can touch it. It was, it was idols and things that were used in, in, uh, in bad ways, and so Israel is supposed to stay untainted. They're supposed to be clean from this, and so the spoil was to be set aside, not touched. Uh, so Joshua 7.21, it says, Achan saying when he got caught, because Israel's under judgment, because of his sin, this is his secret sin. He says, when I saw the spoil, a goodly Babylonian mantle and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, when I saw them, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth, in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. So he saw it, and then he coveted, and then he took, and then he hid. And there's the cover-up. Sometimes the cover-up is worse than the actual sin. <laughs> so you see the progression. And it's important to understand the dynamics so that we can catch ourselves and not get beaten up because you have a temptation, but understand the temptation creates a test for you. So the Lord wants to reach into our hearts and to make our hearts new. Uh, when I became a Christian, it was a profound shift in my nature and character, my motivations, my desires shifted. So things that were tempting me before, it's almost hard to express it, except that when I, I became a Christian at 16 years old, when that happened in me, a lot of the things I desired, a lot of the things that I wanted in my life, a lot of the things that I was interested in doing, completely left. Doesn't mean I didn't have temptation, but what it means is that the fundamental core of who I was as a human being, as a person, what I wanted, my inner, my deepest motivation shifted. I, I no longer wanted to go party here or do this here or do that, see? In other words, my heart literally changed. I'm like, I want nothing to do with that. And I'm talking like from one week to the next when I had that moment of surrender to Christ, there were certain things I just was not going to do anymore. And it wasn't because somebody imposed a new law on me and said, oh, well, you can't do that. In fact, I don't know that I even understood fully the law of God, or I certainly couldn't have taught any kind of a message. But the fact is the Holy Spirit came within me and did such a radical change within me that he became a law within me. But that's the, that's the beauty in understanding that that the law itself, yes, it does, it's a tutor that leads us to Christ, but unless we take that final step and make it to Christ, we just end up under the weight of the law. When grace is just around the corner where God extends this, this pardon and mercy and grace, if we'll just come to him. While we were sinners, yet sinners, Christ died for us. So, I'm trying to, I guess, express to you that, that it's in Christ that God actually will deal with our actual deepest wants and desires and can actually begin to mold and shape them and alter them. And it requires oftentimes a surrender to him and acknowledgement. Remember the scripture says, confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. In other words, sin has caused damage in us. There's a need for healing even after sin. Confess your faults, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. In other words, restored. And that's where the idea of honesty, the idea of brokenness comes in. And until a person often understands that and they continue to cover it up and they continue to bury it, they continue to hide it in the back of their tent as deeply buried as possible and I never have to really deal with it and, and yet it's still there and it's still speaking so I love, I say, I mean, Israel's story. 
his testimony of his life, that it kept speaking to him. And God can be very relentless when there's something like that that's off in our lives. And it's very important to take it seriously. Allow him to change your heart. I loved what he said at the very end of his story. He says, I never stole again. See, he had a change of heart. He had probably had a change of heart long before the day he had the moment of reckoning with dad. But the fact is that, that he had a change of heart and God really convicted him deeply and he, he had a cleansing. He had relief. He felt relief at the end. You finally could unload this. The confession is very powerful. So this is about transformation from the inside out. So many people kind of misunderstand this and they think that going to church and Christianity and kind of finding religion or however they put it, they think, and so many people just think it's all about trying to coerce from the outward, keep these rules and behave this way and look like this and make it, see, and when you think that way, some behavior modification can be very helpful, especially when raising children. But the fact is, in the long run, that is not the resolution that God is seeking for in our hearts. He is seeking for a transformation of the heart. And that's why Jesus kept pointing people. He said, yes, the law says this, but what's in your heart? It's from the heart that all this begins. It's from the heart all these awful things take place. It starts in here. So let's deal with it in here. John the Baptist said this in the beginning of his ministry, and he was doing mass baptisms in the Jordan River, and they were coming to him. And then the, some of the religious leaders came and looked like they wanted to be baptized, and so he starts preaching at them in front of all these people. He says, so produce fruit that is consistent with repentance. Demonstrating new behavior that proves a change of heart and a conscious decision to turn away from sin. That's from the Amplified Version. But basically what John the Baptist is saying as he's preparing the way for Jesus is he's saying, prove it. Are you legitimate? Are you truly his? Are you walking after him? then prove it. Let's see if the way you live your life indicates is appropriate to the way you say you believe. So God is jealous for us. And if you're truly his, then he'll never stop working in our hearts. He will never stop convicting us in searching our hearts. If you could stand with me. Uh, do we have an invitational? I want us to take a few minutes, you know, as we, as we concluded the 10-part series, but, but I realize as we get to the matters of the heart, a lot of times the Lord starts stirring things up in us. Uh, sometimes things will come to your memory and go, you know what, you didn't really resolve that, remember that? You know what, you really weren't honest about this. You know what, you know, and the Holy Spirit is coming around as you're hearing a message like this, the Holy Spirit is messing with us. That's what he does. He convicts the world of sin, right? And he leads us to the truth. But ultimately, why would he kind of mess with our heads and our hearts and our conscience like that? Because he wants us to be restored.
So I want to, I just, as we close, I, I want to ask if, if some of you, as I was kind of describing, kind of maybe in our past or things that the Lord starts dealing with during a message like this, you realize that's something unresolved. That's something that I really need closure with the Holy Spirit in this matter. And whatever that looks like, whatever, you know, I, I mean, the Holy Spirit will come and He'll make a prod. I could suggest maybe He would do this or that, but I have no idea what it is in your past. You may think, well, I never thought that was really a big deal until right now, all of a sudden I have an awareness. And so uh, what, I, what I really like to do is just invite you just to have some altar time. I want to invite you to just come to the altar and just present it to the Lord, whatever the area of conflict is, whatever the area is, something's not resolved, something's not clear in your conscience, something is, you know, whatever that looks like, but you know somehow you need to bring this to the Lord, okay? And I think that just being able to come to the altar and just, and, and we may or may not pray with you, but, I, but it's more important that you bring it to Him. He's here to respond to you. So I just want you to say, sing this again. I just want you to slip out of your seat. Just come down and we'll just kind of a time with the Lord.
So uh, one more thing, I just want to be sure, because I really laid out the gospel today, a couple of times actually. And perhaps you're here today, yeah, I'm on. Perhaps you're here this morning and you haven't really, don't have confidence that you've been born again, that you, you know God, that you've really and truly begun a relationship, a real relationship with Him. I described some of my own life and the way God deals with us, the way He speaks with us, the way He leads us. There's a relationship that He wants to have with you. But so I want to ask if there's anyone here today who would just say, you know what? I need to I need to settle this. I need to get right with God. I need to really and truly begin to follow Him and serve Him in the way you're referring to, to be born again. And so is there anyone here this morning to say, yes, that's me. I, I, I want to make a, a decision to follow Christ, to be His disciple, to walk after Him, to be born again. If that's you, just slip your hand up. Yeah, yeah. Anybody? All right. You kind of have to stare a minute and make sure I don't miss hands. I'm not missing anybody's hand, am I? Oh, okay, Sarah. Yeah, was there another hand? Did I see another one corner of my eye? I thought I saw somebody else. Okay. But I saw this one and that one. Okay. Anyone else? Today's your day. Christmas season, no better time than to say, now I'm beginning a walk with God. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Is there anyone here that would say, you know what, I, I began to walk with God and I just have just wandered off into darkness. It almost seems like I don't even know Him anymore. I need to come home. Who, who's that? Slip your hand up. Who's that? Let's pray. Let's, let's move past that. Thank you, Lord. So let Sarah, I want to get with you right from okay. All right. Let's just lift our hands to the Lord and just thank Him for His generous presence this morning. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the generosity of your presence, your spirit here among us today. Lord, I pray that we would be a light to the world around us, that we would reflect you as we're approaching a time with family and friends and so forth, interacting with a whole new group, set of people that we don't always see from week to week. But God, we pray you prepare our hearts to be a witness and to have wisdom and how to, how to represent you well in an otherwise dark world. So, Lord, we pray, use us today in Jesus' name. Amen.